Good morning, everyone. Welcome to North Point Church Live uh, on Facebook, and we're glad to have you here. And wherever you're tuning in from, uh, we welcome you to be a part of our service this morning. As you can tell, uh, we're not in our auditorium at this point, and, uh, but we welcome you uh, due to circumstances beyond our control. Uh, we've had to um, uh, cancel uh, in-person services this morning. And, uh, but next week we plan to uh, be right back again into the auditorium. And I'm glad you got word that we we're going to be online, that you're with us today. And uh, so happy, happy that you can be a part of us this, this morning. And gather our uh, hearts together in unity online so that we can worship the Lord. Uh, you know, my wife and I have made this house right now a place of worship. And... Uh, May you do that too, that in your home right now, that you are now standing on holy ground, uh, you are in a place of worship, and your heart is in a place of worship. So I'm just going to ask you if you could make sure that there's nothing around that's going to uh, take your attention away uh, from worshiping the Lord today and uh, hearing his voice speaking to your heart through his word. And so again, welcome to you. And uh, many are probably tuning in as, as I speak here, and uh, I'll be talking some more. But uh, I want to start out with a song here that we had planned to do for our service anyway, a couple of songs. And I want you to sing along. The songs that we have are kind of older songs, so I think you should know them. You might know them. You may not know them, but they're easy to get to and uh, catch. And so I want you to sing. That's why it's important that your place be a, uh, your house, wherever you are right now, be a place of worship. So you can just sing right out because I need you to cover my voice and uh, you take over uh, so that you don't have to hear me singing. <laughs> okay. But we do this to worship the Lord. All right. So it doesn't matter. The Lord hears our hearts and uh, uh, it is beautiful music to him no matter how we sing. Right. This song is Shout to the Lord. Oh, my days. Ah. 
nothing compares to the promise that we have in Jesus Christ. And uh, what a joy that is to know that for sure. And that we have the Lord. Uh, I trust today that you're the one that following the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And uh, we want you to understand and know that as, as a church, but as followers and understanding where we are in Jesus Christ. I want to share some uh, from Psalm before we get into this next song, which is You Are My All in All. Psalm 121 says this, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. his name indeed he is worthy to be praised and uh, um, we're here to do that today and I'm glad again if you're just tuning in I welcome you to North Point Church uh, page and uh, we are having a uh, we're not having in-person service today but I'm coming to you from my dining room uh, here at my house and Jill and I welcome you with us but your place your place where you are right now is a place of worship and I want you to think of that, that uh, right now you're worshiping the Lord right there. It is, it is the sanctuary by which uh, you and the Lord have come together with the rest of us that have joined in today. And I'm just kind of the facilitator for you to bring to you today not only the music uh, that you are singing along with me. I don't want you to get the impression that I'm the entertainment for today. I, I want you to sing along with all your heart 
unto the Lord um, and uh, that we worship together. And I'm worshiping, and I hope you are too. I'm just going to take a little moment here uh, just to share some announcements with you and that uh, we will be gathering together once again next Sunday uh, for our worship service in our auditorium at North Point Church, barring any other issues. And uh, we want you to come. If you've not been to uh, be with us in a while, I urge you to come and worship with us. Uh, there are several things that is important for the gathering to take place among believers in Christ. Uh, one, it is to unite together in worship unto the Lord, but also it is a place by which you can exercise your spiritual giftedness. Well, I don't have any spiritual giftedness, right? Yes, you do. Uh, you, you don't have it of yourself. It is something that God gives to you by the Holy Spirit. And uh, you cannot exercise that spiritual gift when you're not with other brothers and sisters in Christ. I know this is a hard time to, to do that and to gather, but it is part of the building up one another. Uh, Ephesians calls it, calls it the building up, the edifying of one another in Christ. And that's why we gather uh, to worship, to build one another up, and to serve one another. Another reason is to do the serving of one another uh, also and, the serve, and, and to be a part of ministry that takes place in the context of the gathering. So I want to remind you to do that and to gather together. Continue to pray for those of you who are part of uh, North Point Church. Pray for uh, those that we've been thinking about, the illnesses. Uh, I know Lori Miller's uh, daughter, if you haven't got word, uh, is doing much better. She had COVID. Uh, she's pregnant, uh, but she's getting over the COVID. And that's good, 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 good. And we praise the Lord for that. Um, and uh, um, I know we prayed for Jeff Kinnip's brother, and he is getting over the COVID as well. So that's wonderful good news. And there's some others that have COVID, but we're still praying for them. You remember Annette and Carrie going through it. Uh, Andrew feels like he's coming down a little bit with the symptoms of it. Uh, of course, he's having to uh, not go to work um, and until he, uh, that time period is over with, a couple of weeks, and then he'll be able to go back to work, barring he has no uh, COVID virus in him. So we want to pray for them. Uh, other things going on. I just want to bring uh, to you also Shirley. Cook, who has uh, COVID, struggling with COVID right now, and uh, continue to pray for her. Uh, and we were with uh, Becky not too long ago, Becky, uh, Jeremy and Becky, and just ask that you continue to pray for them as they process through their time. And Becky says she's doing better. Um, and But, you know, that's a process. It's a process, and we need the Lord all through that process. And so let's just... I'm going to take you to the Lord right now. Think of yourself now entering the throne room of God. Right there where you are, whether you're in your house or in your car, out in the shed somewhere, uh, outside maybe on the front porch. You just entered into the throne room of God, and we're going to pray to him right now. Let's bow. Father, we come to you. We thank you that you're always there. You never sleep. You never slumber that you always protect us, you always overshadow us by your love and your grace and your mercy. So we pray for the Petty family who has been uh, hit with this COVID virus. Ask your healing power to be upon them um, and, and get them out of this thing. And Shirley as well, uh, she is battling with it. Protect uh, Roy and the others uh, in the household and, and the people that come in contact. I, I pray, God, that you would Put a, a protection around the vulnerable and uh, strengthen those that are, uh, are sick. And uh, Lord, we thank you. We know you can do that. Your will is amazing. Uh, we don't understand it sometimes. But you answer our prayers according to your will. And Lord, we want to pray according to your will. It is our desire that you heal them all. And we rejoice in that. And... Uh, Thank you for the blessings you've given to us. Lord, there are those that are tuning in today that have special issues that they need your hand to touch them with. I ask God that you'd be there, and you are there. I don't even need to ask that, Lord. You are there. 
But I guess what I'm asking is that they sense your presence. Lord, may they stop in the moment of their grief, their struggle, whatever that they're going through, and just listen for you and just know that you are there. May they open your word today and may they understand it and hear it. Even this reading of the psalm uh, that we just had a moment ago, that they understand that you are very near them and you love them and you care. So we thank you, Father, for this time. Ask your blessing upon it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we thank the Lord for his answered prayers. And every prayer is answered, by the way. Um, and I had someone say that to me the other day. He said, well, at least God answered that prayer. And then really the reality concerning my cancer, that my cancer is gone. And, and the reality is, is that God answers every prayer. He does. And it's not always our di what we want, you know. Uh, his timing is perfect and his will is perfect. It's hard for us to understand this side of heaven, but I want you to understand that he is, he knows. He is king. We live in a day and time when, you know, we need a king to transcend all the craziness in our world today. And uh, it is so comforting to be able to come to the Lord. I want to sing a song. I want you to sing with me that it's titled, You Are King. Up again, because you were forsaken. I'm accepted.
thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. We just give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to want you to open your Bibles, uh, if you would, with me. And as you're doing that, I want to uh, uh, read something for you that I got in uh, the mail uh, from Tennessee College of Applied Technology. Uh, they sent us a thank you note, and I want to share that with you. And you can see right there, this is from them, a uh, card from them. It says, Dear Pastor McMichael and Jill, my wife, uh, TCAT Harriman would like to thank you and your church for allowing us to use your worship center for our fall orientation. We appreciate your willingness and the hospitality. Uh, the location worked out very, very well for us. Again, uh, thank you for your kindness. Sincerely, uh, Becky Gilbert, College uh, Liaison uh, for TCAT. Tennessee College of Applied Technology. So it was our pleasure, by the way, uh, to host that for them, to allow our auditorium to be used. 1 Timothy chapter 6 is where we're going to be at today. And uh, I usually have my notes printed out. I usually do that at church on Sunday morning, uh, but I'm not at church. I don't have a printer here. And so I, I have my computer off to the side here. And so if you see me reaching over, I'm, I'm doing things to see my notes a little bit but I want you to uh, join with us with your Bibles now anxious to hear what God has for us uh, this morning and first Timothy chapter 6 we're going to start with verse 17 if you get there in fact we're going to read verse 17 through 19 and uh, if you want to you can read with me as I read it out loud and then we're going to go back over and take a look at what we read Verse 17 of chapter 6, 1 Timothy, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor set, to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Today's message is titled, Taking Hold of True Living. Taking Hold of True Living. There's a lot of people in our world today that, that aren't taking hold of true living. They've got a false living, a false sense of, of enjoyment in, in, or uh, some sort of meaning that they're heading in the right direction. But the reality is, is this, and that is there's true life, and then there is that Everything else, <laughs> if you're following along with me. You know, when I first uh, was going to preach this message uh, earlier this week, I told my wife, you know, I, I'm really anxious to move for, into the next uh, area that I'm going to be preaching. I'm going to be preaching on the Gospel of John, by the way, uh, coming up next Sunday. Uh, the Gospel of John and concluding First Timothy. And I think it's, we're at a time that's very important for us uh, to understand who Jesus is. If you're wondering who Jesus is, this is going to be the study for you. And if you are a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, this is going to lift you up <clears throat> as we study the Gospel of John and, and get in there and find out so much about uh, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And for those of you who are just learning and want to know more, who is this person that they follow, that they worship, uh, that they say saves them? And what does that mean? And that, that can be found in the wonderful gospel according to John, the Apostle John. And so we're going to take a look at that starting next Sunday, um, moving into the gospel of John. But here we are, First Timothy, concluding it. Uh, I number each of my messages, and uh, believe it or not, this is the 24th message of First Timothy. Uh, the letter that the Apostle Paul written to a young man named Timothy, who is heading up a church in a town called Ephesus and there were some issues that were involved there that are still issues for us today and uh, we have been on a learning journey to discover uh, how we are to operate how we are to handle some of those issues and I love what he says in the beginning of it this is the, the, the goal of this is love of, uh, you know, from a pure heart 
love from a pure heart. So as he says to them, I, I charge you or I command you, Timothy. Um, we'll see that in the first thing here in this passage. <laughs> he said he has said this six times in the letter of First Timothy. And each one means this, as I've mentioned uh, as we've gone through here, that this is a, Paul is acting as a messenger coming from the general on high, and that is the Lord himself. And he's delivering a message to Timothy uh, and just passing that message along. And so it is a charge from the Lord Jesus himself coming through the Apostle Paul into the heart of Timothy, now to you and me, as we look at 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy dealing with false teachers who have come into the church, uh, people who are, who are tweaking the gospel to the point that it's no longer the gospel, uh, no longer the word of God, and uh, they're finding what is fashionable. In, in order to do that, you have to develop good leadership So uh, in the church. So he's telling Timothy also, here's what you look for in overseers and deacons. And then also he goes on further and he talks about who to honor in the church. It was important in Ephesus that uh, there was a need there uh, that the church people honor certain people, widows, uh, uh, elders, who especially those who, uh, who do well, uh, to, to honor them with a double portion and to honor others as we go through. Then he continues on to talk about watch out for those people who take the word of God and twist it and uh, uh, who are not teaching and not participating, who leading others astray. Uh, watch out for them and guard to the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the, the good word, uh, the commandment. And so now we, we get to hear this last final portion. After he's done this wonderful expression of worship in the last couple of verses before we get to verse 17, unto God and the Lord Jesus Christ, now he's closing up the letter here, and I want to bring it to you. So taking hold of true living. And there's a caution I want uh, to give to you and, and to help you understand. This charge that we're talking about that he's going to give to Timothy is directed to the wealthy in the church, the wealthy followers of Christ. This is not what we're going to see here. It's not a... A, a prescription for people to get to heaven. This is not uh, a, the way and the path to heaven, which so many people think, and, I, and we're going to see this. And as I said before, uh, you know, I was going to jump on the Gospel of John today, and I realized, because I thought, well, this passage doesn't have a whole lot. These couple of verses don't have a whole lot for us today. And as I read through it again, I thought, what am I talking about? It sure does. So here we are. Verse 17, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. Now, the first thing we think of here, and by the way, I have four principles I want to share with you that we're going to get out of these verses. Four principles. So if you're taking notes, make sure you, you mark them down. I'll let you know when each principle comes. But you may be saying, well, this passage isn't for me because I'm not rich. Well, can I ask you something? Uh, are you living in a house? It doesn't matter whether you own it or rent it or whatever else. Are you sleeping at night in a house? Do you have a car? Uh, do you have, you know, if you have more than one car in your driveway, uh, you're rich. Uh, how many bathrooms do you have in your house? So for some of us, we grew up with one bathroom. With a lot of people in the house, still one bathroom. And nowadays, you wouldn't buy a house without at least two, two bathrooms, and you hope for a half. <laughs> and you just think about what you have in your home. And most people today in America you know, have jumbotron TV screens in their homes, and uh, it takes up half the wall. Uh, and they have flat screens in the rest of the rooms of their house for, for many of them. And, uh, uh, you know, you just think about it. We are people that are rich in, in our country, in our day and age. We always think of that person who is more wealthy than I am, right? Um, and we think they're rich, but not me. I'm not rich. Oh, we have, you know what? No wonder so many people are trying to cross 
into America. No wonder we have this border crisis. It's because it's not that people are trying to escape. They are. Many are. Atrocities in their own countries. But they're also looking for the opportunity. If they were just trying to escape atrocities in their own country, they would go to the neighboring country and be okay. <clears throat> they would escape the difficulties. But no, they're coming to America. And you understand, we are totally blessed. And I can't blame them for that, and I don't blame them for coming uh, to America. So we are rich. You're rich. Uh, we have relatively poor people in America. There are homeless people. Um, and uh, we understand that in America. There are people that don't eat well because they don't have the right kinds of foods, or they don't have much food at all. Uh, we, we understand that here, even in America. Uh, it's hard to believe that, but it is. It is true. And if you walk the streets of many of our cities, uh, bigger cities, you'll know and see that. And even here in Rome County, we have a ministry dedicated to homeless people. And there are many that are that way, even in our county. So we are rich for the most of us. Probably if you're listening in now, you're listening on a device that costs you on a monthly basis a regular amount of money. That poor people wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, but you are. And that's great. That's wonderful. So as for the rich in this present age, I'm going to include you and me. You and me in that. Uh, we have so much, and we are so blessed. But what does he say here? He says, charge them not to be haughty. The first thing is not to be haughty. <clears throat> I think the difficult thing here for people who are rich, for the people who feel that all their needs are taken care of, it is the idea <clears throat> that we don't need uh, God in our society. So the first principle I want to bring to you today is this. Principle number one. It's hard to know you're sinking when you're dining on the Titanic. It's hard to know you're sinking when you're dining on the Titanic. I think you understand when I, what I mean when I put that principle in those terms. Uh, we all know the history of the Titanic that even in the beginning hours of the sinking of the Titanic, many would not believe as they were in their dining jackets and dining dresses and eating the wonderful foods and the, you know, the many course meals and hearing the wonderful live music being performed for them. And, and all the things that were going on, the high society people that were there upon that great, wonderful, unsinkable ship, right? <laughs> uh, but it was very hard for them to think that they were drowning as it is for rich people to grasp and understand the need for Christ we see that in Mark chapter 10 verse 23 through 25 this is uh, where, where this young man if you recall if you're familiar with the scripture where a young man comes along a young rich man came up in his souped up red you know chrome wheeled camel and uh, he said, I want to be your disciple, Jesus. And Jesus told him, you got to sell everything you have. Get rid of everything you have and then follow me. And you know the story in that the rich young man went away very sad because he could not get rid of his riches. He would not let those things go. He had a, he had a hold on them. He took hold of those things. And he went away sad, but Jesus follows up this with, to his disciples that were listening and looking on. He says in Matthew 10, 23 through 25, And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. I think we're at that point in our society today where our young people are now questioning, do they even need God? Because all their needs are met. We are in a place where 
Our young people have need of nothing, so therefore they feel no spiritual need. They feel no lostness. They feel no sense that, that uh, there is something better because they've got the better now. They've got all of heaven they want right now in their hands. And so it is very difficult. In fact, it says here it's very easy that in this present age, and I think that's interesting that it's written that way here because this is a present tense. This is referring to a present age. It may say world in your Bible, uh, in your English translation, but the reality of that, if you break it down, it is in the present tense and is the word eon, which you understand the word eon. It is a time frame. It is this present age, this present age that they were living in, and I believe fits in our time too. Charge them not to be haughty. Haughty. Uh, it means uh, indicating uh, that they can be arrogant or lofty-minded. Lofty-minded. They lifted up themselves above uh, all the other troubles and trials of life because they had their needs met. We get that way. We've got everything all settled. You've got your retirement settled. You've got your, your insurance, your health insurance. You've got so much things set in your life. Uh, you've got a good job. Whatever it is in your life going on. And even if you don't have one of those things, you still got a pretty good life, right? We're blessed. We're blessed. Let's just <laughs> admit that. We're blessed. And we tend to get a little lofty-minded. We tend to get a little high-minded. I am sure glad I'm not like one of those people over there who come begging all the time, who have to stand in line for food. I'm glad I'm not like one of those people. I'm glad I've got my job. Yeah, isn't that interesting? We're going to talk about that for in a moment. But it says not to be hard. That's the first negative thing here. As we understand ourselves in the midst of a sinking Titanic, uh, present age that we live in, not to be haughty. As followers of Christ, we cannot give this air of pride. We let, cannot let pride overrule and reign us and go before us into a world around us who need to hear about Jesus. But it says another thing here is not to set, tell them not to set their hopes on those riches, on the uncertainty of riches. So the first thing is that we are not to set our hopes. And you are not to set your hope. What are you hoping today? You know, are you worried about things and, and, and you're, you're setting your hope on something? Maybe it's a person even. We are rich with friendships. We're rich with relationships sometimes. And sometimes we set our hope on a friendship. But here in this context, it's riches riches, this abundance that we tend to set our hope on. This, what we feel is security. We call it security. How's your security? How's your financial security? You know, and, and we think that is meaning that we got it all set. But here the Word of God calls it the uncertainty of riches. Do not set your hope. Don't lean on don't rest in, don't be filled with pride because you have a 401k, because you have a savings account, because you got an IRA, you, because you got, uh, you know, a wealthy uncle, you know, or something, whatever it is that you're, you might be resting and setting your hope on and leaning on and that's going to take care of you the rest of your life and keep you above the troubles and trials of this life. And the reality is that those are uncertain things. Uncertain. We know that by the crash, stock market crash of the 30s and how bad and horrible things got. In fact, I would encourage you to read some of the history of that time period and know what some of the families had to go through during that time. It went from rich and wealthy from, from riches to rags, from riches to rags, in one night, in one night. We all know that experience when all is well and all of a sudden things aren't well anymore. Even in our health, 
We, we depend so much on our health. I, I'm going to admit to you that I did. I hardly ever went to the doctor. And then one day I woke, I woke up, as it seemed to, and I've got four-stage can cancer. And it's all over me. A complete turnaround in my understanding of the brevity of life and the certainty of health, the certainty of riches. That we can be, it can be taken away. Even during this pandemic, we're seeing so many people affected financially by the loss of their jobs. And now we have those who had the jobs, who ran the jobs, who owned the jobs, they're going out of business because they have lost money and they have lost their wealth and they can no longer keep those things going. They even provide jobs when people are ready. So charge them not to be haughty, you and I not to be haughty or assert our hopes on the uncertainty of riches. The uncertainty of riches. Proverbs 23, verse 4 and 5 says, Do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. When your eyes light on it, it is gone. For suddenly it sprouts wings, flying like an eagle toward heaven. Here's your, here's your wealth that you're going for. There it goes. It's off. It's gone. It sprouts wings and it flies away to the sky, to the heavens. Jesus tells a little story about the barn builder. You remember him? In Luke chapter uh, 12, verse 15 through 21, we won't take the time to go there, but just, uh, you know, he, he tells of the uncertainty of riches in this story of a man who uh, had wonderful fields that gave great crops and his barns became full. And so what he did, he says, I will tear these barns down and I'll build bigger ones and newer ones. And then I'll just retire and kick back and rest and enjoy everything the rest of my life. Sounds good, doesn't it? But Jesus goes out and says, you fool tonight, your life will be required. He never got that far to building the barns. He never got that far to enjoying the things of life. For he met with the destiny of his life right then. Uh, Proverbs says this, in the pursuit of fi uh, financial gain, learn to desist from it. And know and understand the teaching of that is that it is uncertain. Riches are uncertain. In your pursuit of life, don't let finances be the reason you pursue uh, into an area. Of, of, of vocation. Let it be because you love the thing, you love the job, you love what it's going to do for people, you love what it's going to do and enjoy in your family and life and how it's going to help you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Let that be your guiding direction. Uh, and of course, we all need money, right, to, to buy food and stuff. We do need that, so that's important. But how many times in my life I can tell you of the people who came to me, especially in my 20s, who tried to get me in a money scheme. And even as you get older, there are still people that try to get you into a money scheme and um, promoting the idea that you can be rich quick or you can be rich soon and then you, d you could retire and sit on your porch the rest of your life and just enjoy the money coming in from your involvement in their scheme. Watch out for that. Watch out for that. That's not where you want to be anyway. You don't want to be sitting on your porch for the rest of your life. You know, uh, you want to be doing the things. And we're going to talk about that for a moment because he says to charge them not to be haughty nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. But he does tell you what to put your hope on. If you look in the Word of God there, it's very clear uh, that... So we are to put our hope on God. We are to set our hope on God. We are to fix our hope on God. Anchor, if I could use the word, our hope on God. It's not on our jobs, not on the riches, not on our investment plan. It's not on all these things that the world tells us to be involved in. But our true hope is to be set upon God. 
upon God. So that leads us to principle number two. Remember, principle number one, it's hard to know you're sinking when you're dining on the Titanic. Know this, know this, that of the uncertainty of riches. Don't set your hope on that, but only on God. Principle number two is this, only God can truly satisfy. Only God can truly satisfy. I hope you understand what I'm saying there in that. The reality of life and true living is when we understand that principle that only God can satisfy. It's not even a job that you love to do, but it's really only God that can satisfy. We need to find our hope and our joy in God, our God. And so it is there that the Apostle Paul tells Timothy to say to those rich people in the church to set their hope on God. And it's what does it say about that? Who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. So in that one sentence, we see this, that our hope is to be set on God. Who richly, uh, did you see how he did that? Don't set your hope on the uncertainty of riches, but set your hope on God who richly, it's the same kind, it comes from the same root word, the riches, the uncertainty of riches, but richly, God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Boy, there's things in life that you enjoy, aren't there? I mean, uh, I get up in the mornings, my wife and I will sit on the front porch and we'll look out into the trees of, the, uh, of our property and we'll hear the animals, the birds and squirrels and chipmunks and, and occasionally other animals and just see the, the beauty of it all, the, the true enjoyment and understanding of that. I get involved with people, and there's enjoyment in people, and the friendships of people, the connectivity of people, the ideas of people. There's so many things, and you can draw them out this, this, what God provides, your creativity. How many of you enjoy creating things with your hands, whether it's artwork and painting, drawing, whatever it might be, to uh, woodcrafting, to metal crafting, anything like that, that you can enjoy. Uh, God gives that to you to enjoy. Enjoy. And he richly provides that. Children. Even your children to enjoy. What joy that is. And grandchildren for some of you. Grandchildren. That you enjoy them. Don't set your hope on anything else but God. For only God can truly satisfy. Jeremiah 17, verse 7 through 8, talks about being like a tree. Those who trust in God, who set their hope in God, are like a tree planted by the water, that even when the drought comes, they will still sprout fruit. They will still yield uh, fruit. Because their roots are planted by the wonder and beauty of God's provision. Matthew 6, 33, one of my favorite verses. It says to, after Jesus has been talking about, you know, see the sparrow and, you know, what he does. And God sees the sparrow and you see the lily of the field and they spin or toil not, but yet God clothes them beautifully. And he, he winds it up, he says, but for you, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Don't worry about what you will eat, what you will drink, what you will wear. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of those things, all these things will be added unto you. We miss out so much on the joy of things by the pursuit of things that have nothing to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. We miss out so much because I can't come to church because I've got to work. I can't serve in this ministry because I've got to go to work. I can't do this because I'm in the pursuit of finances. Financial security is it. But this is saying, watch out for that. Watch out for that. Only God can satisfy. Only God can meet your true needs. Only God can be trusted to meet your needs. My friends, you're missing out on true living when you're chasing after the world and what it 
calls for you to do. It calls for you to do. We're going to go on to the next principle. In verse 18 and 19, we see principle number three. Principle number three says, let your works speak louder than your wealth. Let your works speak louder than your wealth. That's principle number three. <clears throat> Taking a look at verse 18, they are to, they mean the rich people, that's you and me, right? Uh, they are to do good. To be rich in good works. And by the way, this is where confusion takes place. Some people take this verse and will make it their life verse saying, I'll get to God if I just do good works. But good works doesn't save you and me. Good works doesn't get us into heaven. That's not what this is talking about. This passage is talking about. In fact, these rich people are people who are already on their way to heaven because they've placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You understand what I'm saying there? And so make sure that nobody around you is getting this wrong. This is not a pattern for salvation, but this is a pattern to true living in Jesus Christ. And so here we are. They are to do good work, to be rich in good. You see what he did there again? He used that word rich again. He says, as for the rich man in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, not to sell their, not set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good works. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. This is letting your works speak louder than your wealth. Now, not a ticket to heaven, but it is a life of proclaiming Christ through your riches, through what you have, being rich in good works, being generous and ready to share. Second Corinthians chapter eight verse five talks about those Macedonian believers who, uh, in their poor state that they were in, uh, they could hardly rub two nickels together, as it were, there in Macedonia. Uh, but the Apostle Paul speaks very highly of them and what it says there, but they gave of themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. They gave to be a part of the ministry of the Apostle Paul, one of the great missionaries of the Bible, um, who went around establishing churches, proclaiming the gospel of Christ. And Macedonia Church was one of those churches that Paul was a part of starting and these poor people wanted to be a part to help Paul uh, move forward and start other churches and to help other people know how they can have life everlasting, how they can have sins forgiven and a home in heaven, a relationship with God who created them. And so they gave, even in their poor estate, even in their, their the poorness, they didn't have, but they gathered together. But here's the trick of it. The idea here in this passage is that we are to do good works, to be rich in good works, but we are to be generous and ready to share. The trick of that is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 there, verse 5, that they gave of themselves to the Lord first. They gave of themselves to the Lord first. You have a, a problem with giving to people. You struggle with, with that. I, I, I can understand. You know, you're, why can't they do their own thing? Why can't they work? Let them get a job. Why are they begging? You know, I don't know what goes through your mind. Maybe it's just hard for you to do that, to give. Here's a step. Here's a thing to do to help you with that. Give yourself to the Lord first. You see, when our giving, our generosity lacks, when we're unready to share, I know people that put money in their pocket every time they come to church so that they can give and be ready to give to those whom the Lord impresses upon their heart to have a part in their life and that helps them in their, in their need. I, there are people like that. You know how that happens? Is that, you know, they gave themselves first to the Lord. So examine your own heart. Where am I in my own relationship with God? Where am I in that? Am I so self-centered now that not even the Lord can impress upon my heart to participate in ministry 
with another person or to give generously to this thing or to be ready, even ready to give. I, I, I mean, I'm ready to give. I got in, I got my spending money in this pocket, but I got my giving money in this other pocket, ready to give when the Lord tells me to. And guess what? If the Lord wants me to, I'll take my spending money and I'll give that too. If the Lord wants me and he puts it on my heart to do so. That's the mark of a, a Christian rich person. I have met many wealthy uh, Christians in my lifetime. And it has been amazing to me to see the generosity that they have living out Christ. So they let their works speak louder than their wealth. Many of us uh, find it a little intense to be near wealthy people. We think we're going to say something wrong or whatever, use the wrong fork, something. Uh, but my goodness, my goodness, uh, many of these people that know the Lord uh, are so generous, so loving, and, and so near the Lord that they are true examples of him. Uh, I knew a missionary who was a doctor, and uh, uh, he became a doctor in, in the country of Haiti. Here he was, he was a wealthy man himself in his own practice, and he and his wife went to the mission field. And he came back off the mission field, and my wife and I were invited along with them to participate in a dinner at some people's home. And we got to that home at that dinner, and uh, this doctor, missionary doctor, uh, saw the, the serving trays, the, the cut glass serving trays. And he be began to pick them up and look at them, and uh, because of his previous life as a wealthy doctor, probably coming from a wealthy home, I'm not sure, he had a tremendous understanding and appreciation for real cut glass uh, serving ware. And he just talked about this, he used terminology, and the people that we stayed with, oh my goodness, you know all about that? You know, she, she's thinking we got, you know, these poor missionaries, well, that was Jill and I. <laughs> but here this doctor who had known what wealth was, and gave all that up and went to the mission field in a poor country of Haiti and still there to this day uh, I'm sure he's retired now because of his age at this point but he understood what it meant to be rich but he also understood what it meant to give everything to the Lord to serve him to let his good works speak louder than his wealth and for that, that was a tremendous example to me as a missionary to see that. He felt very comfortable in whatever state he was in. Be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Principle number four, the final one, is this, and that is heavenly treasure is accrued on the deposits of today. Heavenly treasure is accrued on the deposits of today. Of today, I know it's a fancy word. It's a financial word, accrued. Um, but it's the idea that it grows, accrued, it grows uh, on the deposits that we make today in our present age. Remember what I mentioned before and earlier in verse 17 where he's referring to those who are rich in this present age? Well, there is a future age to come. A future age to come. A future time. And... The things that we do, the good works that we do today, those things he's talking about to be rich in good works will create a growing deposit of treasure for our future. What does it say here in verse 19? Well, verse 18 says they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future. For a good foundation for the future. You know, we think we've got to collect the money. We think we've got to save money. We think we've got to build that retirement. We think we've got to do all these things that the world tells us that we're supposed to do. And it's not wrong to do those things. 
but we spend a lot of time and energy on those. In fact, they become priority over the service and ministry of the Lord in our day and time. And we miss out building a sure foundation for our future. I think it's very interesting that the very thing that we spend a lot of time and worry, anxiousness over, isn't even the thing that builds the sure foundation. It's the good works that we do. It's the generosity we, we do and display. It's the readiness throughout our life of generosity to do good works to people around us, and to, to minister as the hands of the Lord into the lives of others. I want to ask you, um, if you were to check out your deposit account in heaven, how would it look? Um, we're so anxious to get online many times to find out what our savings account, our checking account, whatever account you might have is doing, whatever market, uh, money market thing you're involved in, how much interest it's gaining. And I was so concerned about that. But are we concerned about the heavenly treasure that we are to be building? In Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says it this way, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. I mean, I could stop there, uh, knowing that the Lord Jesus Christ gives that command. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's not hard to know where people's heart is these days, right? We just see what they're spending their time, efforts on, and we know where their treasure is. We know where their heart is because their heart will follow their treasure. So how that, how's that going for you? Uh, it talks about the treasures of this world where rust, rust and moth uh, and thieves break in. I remember one day when Jill and Emily and I came walking into our home, only to discover it had been broken into and many things stolen. Uh, we didn't have a lot of great value, but we had a lot of things of uh, memory uh, that was mementos of our past uh, that they took. Uh, don't know why. They thought maybe they could get some money for them, I suppose. But a lot of things were taken. But they were just those things. 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 And we had to come to the understanding that our treasure is not here in this world. But our treasure is to be laid up in heaven. How are you doing laying up treasure in heaven? Heavenly treasure is accrued, is built, is growing on the deposits that you make today. Today. And we do those by the good works, by the generosity of our life. Do you hang on to things? Do you hide from people? Do you shrink back from ministry? Do you pursue ministry? Do you look for ways to minister into the hearts and lives of people on a regular basis? Are you ready to do those things? Are you, are you laying up treasures in heaven? Boy, this touched my heart too, this passage. I am so glad I didn't skip it. I'm so glad that I didn't say, oh, let's go on to the Gospel of John and, and get that going. I'm so glad that we, we started, started this because at the end of verse 19 it says, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Truly life. My friends, Jesus said, I come that you might have life and you might have it abundantly. You might have it abundantly. We spend our times on the things that don't give abundant life. We spend our time and energies on things that are worthless. Can I ask you to take your time today and do the things that are worthy. Do the things that will seek the Lord. 
that will be beneficial into the ministry of the Lord in the lives of others. Things that will help you grow in Christ. Spending time in His Word, committed to Him, coming to church on a regular basis when you can. And even when you can't, even when you can't come to church, come anyway. Come anyway. See how God will bless you as you come and worship Him and minister to others. And edify their life with a word that God has spoken to you about. A special word from the Word of God that He's been teaching you. Lifting others up. And if you're ready, ready to serve, ready to, to be generous to other people, can I urge you to do that? For He is worthy. He is worthy. We sing those songs. And He is worthy for us to spend our time and energies for His purpose and His ways. Let's bow our heads right now as we close. Father, we come to you. We thank you so much, Almighty God, that this passage is here. We are really rich people. We're not a one percenter here in America, but we're, we are blessed abundantly just by the fact that we live in this country. There are things that we get. People who don't have jobs can get money still from the government. They, they can get so many things to help them. Father, we're not a poor people. But we act like we deserve all the money and we deserve everything that we get and that we grab onto and we don't let anybody have any of it. And so, Father, I pray that you'll turn our hearts. You'll turn our hearts around. That we, again, pay attention to the things that are important. And that is your word. And the expression of a life of Christ working through us that we don't fall prey to the pridefulness that riches bring, but rather that we do the things that are honorable for you. We do good works. And we're generous, Father. Help us to be that. For there are people that do have many needs around us. Help us, Lord. Help us to take steps today to be a part of that, to enter into their lives, and to be people who will be generous and and express our riches unto them and be a part of their lives so that they might grow in Christ. They might even minister on your behalf. I think of the many missionaries across this globe who have step, stepped away from uh, a life of certainty, in a sense, and stepped into a life of uncertainty in our thinking, but the reality is just flip flop when anybody who decides the call of the Lord upon their life to serve you in a full-time way, to say, this world is not my home, I'm going to serve the Lord the rest of my life, they've stepped away in, from the uncertainty and stepped into the certainty of resting in the hands of a mighty Savior, a mighty God who can provide all our needs. Lord, we're testimony of this. Jill and I are testimony of this. And we've seen you do it. We've seen you do it. And I thank you, Almighty God. Bless now, for you are worthy of all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As we close today, I just want us to join together. There you are in your home. And uh, still a place of worship. And we want to sing that song, Worthy. Worthy. Would you sing with me on that? Thank you.
So glad you joined us this morning. May God bless you as you serve him and live out your life generously for the cause of Christ. Thank you so much. May God bless you. Amen.